as public comment. Comment about anything not on the agenda. Nothing will move to approval of the agenda. I motion to approve the agenda. I will second. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Next up is consent calendar. Move that we approve the consent calendar. All second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next up is the business, which is the 22 audit presentation. Hi, oh, Bonnie. I think that's you. Sorry, we lost you there. Zoom kicked out, but we're back. Oh, hold on. We were, we were muted. Oh, oh, hang on. Hang on. We were muted. Sorry. So, but are we, we recording? Yeah, we, yeah, we are. Okay, sorry. All right. okay. sorry, Bonnie. We're working through the tech stuff, but we're up to the 22 audit here if you're ready. Okay. Um, so, what we're presenting tonight, can you hear me okay? I think so, yeah. Okay. Uh, is the June 30th, 20 uh, I don't know if you have specific questions, but I completed that uh, early in 23. Uh, just to say that we were there in the field for 23 this yeah. week. Could be heard. Can you hear me? It, we're, it's um, a little choppy, Bonnie. We're trying to figure out if it's your if it's us or, or if it's our, if it's, yeah. I mean, we're on the, the um, ether, so ethernet. I'm not yeah, doing I, not yeah. killing our video and seeing if that. Oh, yeah. I should yeah if you turned your video off, Bonnie, maybe that'll help. As a, turn my as, video off. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. It, uh, it feels some to me, but it's still a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So um, we finished up the audit. As you know, it was a, a long road um, because of the absence of uh, You know, Cynthia stepped in and did a great job getting us. What we did. Um, it was a long process, however, uh, but we through, and like I said, we have started the 23 audit, which is great. Um, we ended up positive fund balance in the general fund and the highway fund um, and funds, actually, uh, which is great. So we don't have any negative fund balances to contend with. Uh, no uh, major issues. We did put comments in the management letter, uh, areas for improvement, but I do realize that that was largely because of not having a regular finance director, which I'm happy to hear. Um, you have Zoe now, which is great. Um, so I don't know if there's any specific questions that you have of the audit, but all in all, the town is in a healthy position, uh, positive on balances, no major issues. And uh, I guess I would to field specific questions. There's several pages to go through, and I know people may have have some just vacation questions. Pops. <laughs> just in case anybody wants to view it who's watching at home or picks it up later, there's an audits tab on the website. It's under, it's in the same spot that you can find the annual reports. So we've got a column that's, I think it's announcements. If you go in there, you can find it or you can search by audit in the search bar too. Um, so that's where we post all of the independent audits. And as Bonnie said, they were in-house doing fiscal 23 yesterday and the day before, working with both Zoe and uh, Ann and Kayla in our finance department and Cynthia from NEMREC, who's been helping us out. Years. <laughs> so what's, what's the timeline? What's the anticipated timeline for that? For 23? Yeah. I, I don't know. Bonnie, is there sort of a best guess knowing it's hard to predict on 23? Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, it's hard to predict because it really depends when we get the remainder of the information. Um, that, you know, we still have, we've done most of the control testing. We still have some work to do on the um, Utilities and uh, fixed asset and debt are probably the big that we have left that we're, we have the debt schedule. We're still waiting for information on the fixed assets and 
still waiting for some information on the utility billing and just some various other outstanding items. I would say best guess, you probably will have a draft by the end of October, if not earlier. Um, and then you can review it and, you know, hopefully we can present it at a December board meeting and it'll be much timelier, hopefully, than it was last So I'm um, We don't like doing June 30th in, in so um, is to, to get it done as soon as we can. But it really depends on see the remainder of the information calls and you know our that we're working on waiting for this information so that puts us on a the timeline we want to be on on a more regular one if you go back the year before i think bonnie came and talked to you in early january yeah. board meeting when we were doing 21 so that's a fairly normal schedule for us which is nice yeah. And you'll have all yep. this information and for the budget process itself too, which is also nice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If there's anything that's germane to that, of course. Yeah, and I think that this year is soon because number one, we were on the uh, Number two, we have both Cynthia and Zoe working. Um, and I just I think this year will be smoother, quicker, um, and we'll get it, you know, be able to get it wrapped up more time. It's amazing what having bodies can do for us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> huh, let's make things easier. Okay. Well, Any questions for Bonnie? Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you, Bonnie. Hey, okay. take care. See ya. Bye, Bonnie. Bye. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the requested action here is that we move to accept the FY22 audit. I'll move that we accept um, as submitted the fiscal year 2022 audit. A second. All those in favor? <laughs> Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next up is interviews for the vacancy of the select board. Two right. um, candidates. We've got Melissa's on mine. Melissa here and Matthew in the room. So, right. so we'll take them uh, one at a time. Yeah. Run through uh, the questions. Uh, well, I was going to suggest that we go through the questions we've worked out, mm -hmm. but alternate rather than doing one and then the other. So ask the questions almost as if it were. A debate format, right? Ask the question and then so ask Matt first, Alyssa second, or whatever, and then yep. ask Alyssa the that second makes sense and, and alternate who goes first. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, seriously. Yeah, yeah no, I'm no, like, I, this I, is getting I, professional yeah. here. <laughs> I get it. I'm um, asking that. I mean, we could flip a coin. <laughs> Alyssa, can you hear us okay? I can, yep. Awesome. Oh, so the charge is in charge. Yeah. All right, so we'll ask the first question. And I I know I wrote and I was in a hurry, but I made some time, so I'm okay with whatever you all figure out. Okay. Thanks, Alyssa. Okay. Alyssa, can can we see you? Oh, hey, <laughs> hi there. Yeah. <laughs> nice to meet you. Hi. Sorry, I couldn't be there in person. So you want to ask the question, have Matt answer it, then have Alyssa answer it? Right. Ask the next question, have Alyssa answer it, then have Matt right. answer it? That, that just seems like a fairer way than, a, a more adequate way than going through each all at once. Okay. Yeah, the question uh, is who, go, who goes first? <laughs> well, it doesn't matter because we're going to flip it around anyway, right? Yeah, so, yeah. All right, let's get it going. Um, so the first question is, why do you want to be on the select board? What qualities, skill sets, and experiences will you bring to the board, and how will those benefit the town? And we'll have Matt answer first. I'm going to ask you to repeat the question, because it was a triple-barreled question. <laughs> so, why do you be on the board? Should we have Matt come up? 
Uh, yeah, yeah, when so you're you answering, because it, it, the recording, it, th this doesn't pick up. Sit here? Yeah, that's okay, sorry. Yeah. I'm noticing that when I listen so to the meetings. Why do you want to be on the select board? Yeah. What qualities, skill sets, and experiences will you bring to the board, and how will those benefit the town? Okay. All right, well, I want to start off by thanking you all for um, inviting me for a conversation this evening. I, I appreciate that. Um, I have been a resident of, of Randolph now for a little over a year. Um, I have been serving on the Planning Commission and uh, very recently was asked to chair the Planning Commission. Um, I moved to Randolph because I was looking for a place to, uh, my wife and I were looking for a place to settle down and to build a life. Uh, for on into our retirement years. We've moved around quite a bit. We um, lived in New York, we lived in Rhode Island, we lived in Michigan, uh, and now here. Um, I put my name in for the select board because I was um, encouraged by a few people in town to think about doing so. Um, it took me a while to decide whether or not I wanted to uh, offer to serve. Um, and that's what it is for me. It's a it's service. I, I see this as an opportunity to serve my community and to give back, as I did when I took the role with the Planning Commission. Um, I uh, My career has been mostly in higher education, at the intersection between higher education institutions and communities, doing community development, um, community economic development, as well as community social development. Um, and I'm in a position right now where I have time to give to my community. I, I'm not, I have a business that I, where I do executive coaching and consulting work. Um, I do a little bit of teaching, um, but I'm not in a situation where I have a nine to five job that takes me away from, or small children that takes me away from the ability to volunteer and to give back and to serve. So that's sort of the why. In terms of qualities, um, as I said, my career has been in community economic and, and social development. Um, I'm fairly good at strategic planning. Uh, that's probably why the Planning Commission appealed to me as a start. Um, you know, I've, I've been um, an executive in higher education, including a college president. Um, I would want the board to know my background in that respect, so I'll take just a smidge more time with this answer to give you that. Um, I was a tenured faculty member at two other institutions before assuming a presidency in Michigan just before the pandemic. At the height of the pandemic, I was asked to take on uh, addressing a very racist set of issues at an institution, which I did um, because it was consistent with my anti-racist values, and ran square into a modern day version of the KKK. So if you Google me, you will find online some not uh, positive things that were posted by the crowd that ran me out of town at this college. And I want to be transparent about that um, so that you know about that. Um, but uh, I'm happy to give you more detail on that at, at some point if you would like. But the thumbnail sketch of it is that I was fighting for the rights of the black community and against the control of a small group of white folks who were killing the college um, and resisting diversity. So, so that's what my answer is. Thank you. Alyssa, would you like to answer the question or would you like me to read it to you again? Um, I think I got at least the first two thirds of it. Um, so <laughs> I um, have, I, my husband and I purchased uh, a house in Randolph Center about six, over six years ago. Um, and uh, I have a close friend that works um, in, I my background is in planning and um, she is in the Royalton area and is on a bunch of planning committees and has been trying to get me involved in a bunch of planning committees. Um, and I saw this opportunity um, come come about and it felt like I had already been thinking about getting involved in planning in the Upper Valley and it seemed like a perfect fit to 
get involved even more locally um, in, in the town I live in. Um, I currently work at the um, Public Service Department at the state of Vermont uh, for the Vermont Community Broadband Board. Uh, we're managing a statewide effort to expand uh, equitable broadband access uh, across the whole state. Uh, and previous to that, I've been there for a year and a half. Previous to that, I've worked um, at the Agency of Agriculture doing um, agriculture rural development efforts. Um, I grew up in, I'm from Pennsylvania, from a small rural agricultural town. So it felt like a natural fit when I moved to Randolph Center in the Randolph, greater Randolph area. Um, and and my husband and I are really enjoying watching the way that Randolph is growing and progressing um, over the six years that we've been here. Um, I have my, as I mentioned, my background is in planning. I have extensive um, experience as a program manager, uh, working on budgets and um, both on the grantee and the grantor side of things um, and doing project and program evaluation. Um, and I think there was one third part of, so that's interest and experience. Um, Benefits and power. Yeah, I think I um, just in general, I've been working at the statewide level. Uh, even when I was in Pennsylvania, I worked for a statewide nonprofit. Um, and then I worked for the state for over six years, over six years now. And um, I, I think I can use those skills of managing programs and um and setting up systems and evaluating situations um in an unbiased way to be able to um contribute to our local community thanks great thank you all right the next question how do you ensure that a level of respect and civility remains between board members and this one goes to Alyssa first. Um, so I currently am a staff member of a, a very small staff within a board <laughs> department within the state of Vermont. So we have three, and then we're federally funded. So we have um, three levels of complicated governance um, in in the work that we're doing. And I feel like one of the skills and the, um, yes, yeah, one of the skills I bring to our team is being able to kind of like look at the big picture, um, take uh, time to make sure I'm listening to all of the voices that are um, that are being heard, um, that are being said, and um, think about what maybe is the underlying issue of uh, of like what the point everybody is trying to get to. Um, it's definitely helped us as a small team be able to figure out how to make meetings run smoother and how to improve um, board relations between the board members and between the board and the staff. Um, so I bring that experience and, and hope that it would translate well um, on this board. Great, thank you. So Matt, would you like me to reread the question? No, I'm good, I'm okay. good, thanks. Um, so every place that I've worked, every board that I've served on, um, I have enjoyed doing so, and I think others have enjoyed my service. Um, just as, as a point of uh, reflection of that, when I resigned my position as college president, almost all my cabinet resigned, and half of the board of trustees resigned as well. 
with me. Um, I have across my career been able to recruit and bring with me people from one organization to another as part of uh, a team. And I have been brought myself into collaboration with people um, who previously collaborated with me. So who are at a new institution or in a new community and want to work together. Um, I take all of those as indicators that I'm a, a pretty good person to work with. Um, at, by way of understanding how I work, um, in my role as an executive coach, I do strength finders training for folks, which is a personality inventory um, run by the Gallup organization. And I can share with you that my strengths types, there are 34 that you can end up in your top five. My top five are strategic, futuristic, activator, relator, and self-assured. And as pertains to this question, I think um, in terms of relating to people, the relator s skill or personality type is someone who builds very strong one-to-one -one relationships. So I would um, commit the time and effort to build individual relationships with each of you. Um, and the self-assured characteristic, it means I don't take things personally. Um, I, I trust my gut, and I also don't invest my ego in ways that make me reactive um, because I trust my gut. So I'm, I'm happy to talk about ideas and not take it personally, which I think is a strong attribute to bring to the table. The next question, describe a time when you were in a leadership position, an extremely difficult situation came up. What was your role in bringing the issue to a mutual resolution among all the parties? Um, well, I've already mentioned one, and I failed at that one, so <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Um, while I was at Brown, I was uh, at the time the director of an institute at Brown focused on public service. Um, and there was a student organization that had built a large presence on campus um, doing what they thought was good uh, service, community service for refugees in the community. Um, my staff and I understood that what they were doing was rather exploitative in the refugee community. Um, sort of white man savior type of approach to their work. Um, and it was inconsistent with the, the, both the values and mission of the university. So um, we uh, had to address it. And um, I think the, 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 the single biggest thing I learned in that um, conflict with that student organization was the power of vulnerability and humility that um, uh, one of my assistant directors made a very strong decision to um, give the group an ultimatum around their funding, and that was the wrong decision to do. And um, the buck stops with me, even though it wasn't my decision. Um, I had to go and, and sit with that group and, and hear their anger and hear their um, frustration and hear their hurt uh, and be vulnerable as the director of the institute that, that uh, an incorrect decision was made. Um, and I had to take a moment to exhibit humility in that there was a piece of the decision that was made that was made based on an incorrect set of assumptions or pieces of information about the student group. My supervisors didn't think that the situation was reconcilable, but the power of being vulnerable and humble in that moment, I think, was the bridge that needed to be offered for the students to cross and meet us on the other side in a place where the university was comfortable with them continuing their program, and the students understood some of the university's concerns and were able to modify their approach uh, in the community. So would you like me to read the question again? Um, yes, that would be great. Describe a time when you were in a leadership position and an extremely difficult situation came up. 
What was your role in bringing the issue to a mutual resolution among all parties? Um, so I, I, I would go back to something I mentioned in my last response, but um, I, I really value that I um, put a lot of effort into being a good listener. Um, and I think one of the key aspects of being a good listener is um, taking the time to find that connection point with people to build the relationship, to have a starting point that the conversation can grow upon. Um, I've so often my leadership role was with dozens, if not hundreds of farmers, either in Pennsylvania or in Vermont, um, through a few different, um, very difficult um, times. So in Pennsylvania, um, I was working for the Pennsylvania Association for S Sustainable Agriculture. Um, and in Pennsylvania, there's um, a large fracking industry that has been um, you know, taking over a lot of uh, the economy <laughs> across the state. And there were, you know, people 100 percent, you know, pro and against it. Um, and even within our organization's board, um, you know, di different people participating um, in activities and others, you know, lobbying 100 percent against what was going on. Um, similarly, when it, in Vermont uh, during when COVID started, I was at the Agency of Agriculture and I was in a statewide leadership role working with all of the farmers markets um, and had to figure out how to listen to hundreds of businesses that were trying to figure out how they were gonna survive through um, all of the different mandates that were coming down on them from the administration um, and having to like, figure out how to um, walk that line of um, you know, being a public servant and answering to um, the administration, but also um, I had already strong relationships with a lot of the farmers across the state and the, and the farmers market managers and, um, and, and put a lot of time and energy into figuring out how we could find something that would work for them, um, but would keep everyone safe. Um, so, um, yeah, I think um, <laughs> again, uh, similar to what Matt said, I don't, I don't know if it was a hundred percent successful. But, you know, it was a very difficult time, but um, I still maintain those relationships, and um, you know, we were able to push through and get farmers markets some exemptions from what was going on and I still feel like that was a success. Hey Alyssa, this is yours first. What would be your budget priorities for the town in the next fiscal year? This one just feels a little bit hard. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm not gonna tell you what the budget is. I'm not gonna tell you if you get any money or not. But, <laughs> <laughs> and also going to be some well around. <laughs> um question, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> what is your answer? No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Woodstock provided us with that question. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's a very different community. Um probably a very different yes, budget. <laughs> I will I will vouch for that. <laughs> um Oh, I guess I have to admit I haven't looked at Randolph's budget yet. So, um, but uh, I look at statewide budgets, multi-million, multi-hundred million dollar budgets um, on a daily basis, uh, running multiple programs for this broadband work that we're doing across the state. Um, and that is, honestly one of the parts of my job that I really enjoy that is not even um, one of my like main responsibilities but um, keeping an eye on um, 
how everything is balancing out and making sure um, I, I, I definitely have a math brain. So um, it's easier for me to, to look at numbers versus reading really long documents. Um, I goals for, I mean, to stay in the black. <laughs> um, <laughs> Goals for the budget, like, I guess I would be interested in aligning some of the different um, development, economic development and um, community development groups and some of their goals and seeing how there might be um, possible alignment between um, some of our local organizations' goals and and the town's goals. I think that's the best I can do off the top of my head. It's not really a fair question. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> May I call five? Get you thinking. Um, Matt? Do you want me to read it again? No, I'm good. Okay. Um, well, if I was Woodstock, I think my priority would be Windex to make sure the snow globe is nice and sparkly. <laughs> <laughs> Very well said. Um, and that is a lot of people's priority. That's right, yeah. But we're not Woodstock, we're Randolph. Um, so I would have three priorities, actually. First and foremost, <clears throat> and, and well above the other two, would be adequate staffing. I think the town struggles with its staffing. I, Glad to hear there may be a, a finance director being hired. Um, I think there are other staffing needs that hinder the town's development. Um, so that would be top priority. The second would be, I think that Randolph has a really good story to tell, um, both historical and more recent, about what a town it is. And I think there needs to be some marketing investment around telling that story. Um, you know, it would be great if in every business you walked in in Randolph, there was one of those hand-drawn maps that shows all the other businesses around town. Um, you know, I'm familiar with a community in another place um, um, called Birchwood, and they have this whole campaign. It's about the same size, and they have this whole campaign called Choose Birchwood. And that marketing campaign has led to businesses moving to that town um, and new resources for the town. So a way of thinking about and telling the story of um, Randolph in terms of a foundation for economic development. I know there's some work around the webpage happening that may be a place to start doing some of that. And the third thing I would say is that I'm working on a project for GMEDC right now, um, which used to be called the Innovation Hub, um, that kind of got off to a really bad start. and. We're going back to square one, and part of my role is to talk to as many people in town as I can to develop a community study for GMEDC around how they might stand up a new organization in town that occupies the space between private business and the town and helps um, foster.
Alyssa, would you like the question read again? Uh, no, I think I'm okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I think in general, um, it's, <laughs> I, my, my partner and I have really loved, um, living in Randolph. It, it felt like home. We've made it our parents' home. Um, yeah, we moved here and loved it so much. We had them move in with us. Um, I think being able to really feel committed to the town um, would, would just take that even a step further. Um, kind of tying back into the budget question, but also, so a lot of my skills revolve around um, program development and, um, and grant management. And one thing that um, I, have always been really good at is working with small businesses and towns and different um, types of organizational organizations and entities um, to seek out grants. Um, and I feel like I would find a lot of pride to be able to think about how I can not only do that, um, you know, for a job more generally, but also use those skills locally to um, help the town and the select board um, think about strategic uh, development through resources that are maybe untapped. Um, and yeah, it would it, it, it would be it would be really great to be able to figure out how to um, bring that into a different part of my life instead of just my nine to five job. <laughs> All right, this question's yours first, Alyssa. What are some examples of ways you've been involved in a community, either Randolph or another community, that has had a positive impact on that community? Um, so, uh, similarly, um, I <laughs> work when I was living in Pittsburgh. Um, I worked with one of the local uh, neighborhood development corporations um, to apply for um, funding to help develop their downtown and develop their local food uh, system and do a marketing campaign uh, for their farmers markets and some new businesses that were popping up. Um, it was in a bigger city of Pittsburgh, but it was a very small neighborhood of Pittsburgh. And so um, while a lot of the work, work that I do has been statewide and it's hard to kind of track um, where the progress is made, that uh, example in particular like stands out in my mind as just like being kind of on the ground and being able to like physically see change um, and participation in the community um, throughout that it, it was a two-year project and um uh and yeah it was to be able to like start with nothing and then be able to measure kind of all the increase in participation and um and, and see visibly some change through the marketing campaign in the community um was really rewarding Thank you. Uh, would you like me to read the question again? No, I think I'm, I think I'm all set. Okay. Um, ironically, I would say I think um, I had significant major impact in the town in which the college resided where I failed at the college. Um, and I feel like I can say that with confidence because the black community and I have stayed very close together and I have helped provide guidance and partnership and solidarity in their political organizing to people, their own city council, for the first time with members of the black community and to take, take control and, um, and exercise voice from the black community and other 
apparatuses of the city in that community. Um, but the other example I would offer is that for 10 years I lived in Albany, New York and taught uh, as a faculty member at Siena College. And while there I built the largest AmeriCorps program housed at a college or university in the country. Um, and that took a lot of work because all of those AmeriCorps placements were in nonprofits throughout the capital region. That meant that we had a network of over 50 nonprofits, all of whom were collaborating and with the college and with each other in that AmeriCorps program. Um, that program still exists today. It's clearly run by someone else now. Um, but it attracted funding from places like the Kresge Foundation, the Arthur Ryan Davis Foundation, the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation, and the Depart U.S. Department of Justice. Um, so those are two communities where I feel like I had a, a very positive impact. Great. Um, and the last question is yours first. You started in your land. That's what happens when you have a number of questions. <laughs> The town of Randolph has been supporting investments in the community through multiple programs to expand our housing options, recreation opportunities, support services, and quality of life experiences. What's your view on economic development within the town, and how would you work to implement those views? So I think that Randolph has the potential to focus around the culture economy, creative culture economy, the food economy, light manufacturing, um, and there may be a couple of other sectors, but I think a strategic approach to supporting defined subsectors of economic development, combined with, um, as I said before, a marketing plan around the quality of life here uh, in Randolph, I think could really move Randolph to the next level. That needs to be done thoughtfully because we don't want to become Woodstock. Um, but I do think there's space for economic development here to, um, to lift all boats. I also think that there is opportunity in the tech, the tech school um, and with some of the existing trades folks and farmers. Uh, take Justin Poulin, for example. Um, I've had a conversation with him about his desire to figure out how to direct market some of his production so that he's not captured by always having to sell in supermarkets. Um, and I think, you know, there's opportunity to support that kind of creative thinking for um, more blue collar folks as well as, as the town moves ahead. That's why I'm excited about the GMEDC project and hope that that bring something to fruition. I guess the last thing I would say is that I am not uh, of Randolph or Vermont. Uh, so if you're looking for somebody who is of Randolph or of Vermont, that's not me. But if you're looking for somebody who chose Randolph and chose Vermont because of what I think Randolph and Vermont are, that's me. I chose to come here because I wanted to live in a community like this. I'm choosing to serve this community because I want to give back to this community. My experience is of communities all over the world, and they're all very different, and they all have different ideas. And some of that experience may be useful and it may not be useful in this context. Um, but that's what, what I think about economic development and a focus for, for Andrew. Great. Alyssa, do you want me to reread the question? Um, I, th I think I'm okay. <laughs> it was a long question, but I got it. Um, I, um, so I really have been encouraged by the, 
number of businesses that have been starting up, especially in the last few years. Um, and there seems to be this momentum of especially younger um, families, younger business, you know, younger business owners um, coming into town. Um, and I think that's something that we can, as a town, embrace and figure out how to support to make sure that those businesses um you know they've gotten off the ground but find ways for them to flourish find ways for them to expand and i think there's a natural collaborative um effort that that i've been seeing ac across town um especially with the recreational community um and the downtown businesses and i think that is something that is will continue to help bring in um, younger families and provide opportunities. Um, I, sorry, can you repeat the housing there? I know there was a housing part and I feel like I had something I wanted to mention. Because the town of Randolph has been supporting investments in the community through multiple programs to expand our housing options, recreation opportunities, support services, and quality of life experiences. What's your view on economic development within the town and how would you work to implement those views? Um, so I think, I know there's opportunities in, um, so, so the person that I mentioned at the beginning that got me kind of intrigued when I read that there's an opening in the Herald and, um, <laughs> uh, she's actually working on housing um, in the whole upper valley um, on housing initiatives um, and figuring out a plan um, and working with a bunch of the towns and so I've been following along with it, it's a difficult dilemma um, as I mentioned I bought a house six years ago and my parents um, moved in with, with us last year and we're still trying to figure out um, a, you know, a, a place that works for uh, this kind of multi-generational living situation um, and construction by prices have not come down yet. So I know there's some things um, the town has been planning and wanting to do and um, the timeline is is out there. It, it, it's, still, it's still rather long, um, especially when people are needing housing today. I think um, I think there are a few programs that are happening where I would want to be able to be that kind of listening ear to be able to be the voice to those bigger programs that are happening to make sure that like um, the programs that are evolving relatively quickly at the state level um, are being able to capture what is actually happening on the ground um, in our towns. Um, it, yeah, in the last few years, working for the state government has been a very different, um, it's been a very different role than what it was previous to COVID um, with the funding opportunities that are available. And I feel like it's an opportunity we haven't, um fully we haven't fully capitalized on the fact that that there are new programs being developed with people actually listening and wanting to try and figure out um a solution um so i think just being that like connecting the dots um between the on the ground what is needed versus um the programs that are quickly being developed um, at a regional and statewide level um, would be something that I would would hope to be able to bring and and discuss and and talk about opportunities with with this team. Great. That's the end of the formal questions. Um, Jennifer, do you want to 
at this point if there's any questions that folks have that are outside of the script or follow-on questions. That was pretty thorough. Tom and I tried. <laughs> <laughs> you threw some. Uh, good old <laughs> Players for back point, here like you point, can't blame point me. Point of information <laughs> both of you. I, oh, that's great. I am retired, but I am working as a journalist in my retirement years and working more hours than I did when I was reti <laughs> not retired. Um, and I cover Woodstock for the local weekly newspaper down there called the Vermont Standard. So. Mm. <clears throat> um, and you are absolutely right, Matt, it's a completely <clears throat> a very different community from Randolph. Um, and it's a very different community from anything I've ever written about. Mm. So, mm. but they just replaced a, <clears throat> a select board member um, <clears throat> and some of these questions flowed from their mm. screening. So. Can I add to, to one of my answers? Is that possible? Sure. I think, you know, uh, I was thinking about this housing piece um, in particular, and my experience in communities that are facing housing crunches has been that, that one of the st successful strategies has been for a community to come together and build a plan, a community-wide plan of all investment opportunities, whether they're private investment opportunities or public investment opportunities. So it could be land that the town owns, it could be land that private landowners own, but sort of developed a community-wide plan. If we had all the housing we needed, what would that look like? Where would it be? What kind of housing would it be? That's a really important first step because developers the way development traditionally has happened is developers have to figure out for themselves where is there an available piece of land, what's the market going to bear for me to develop some property, and they're doing it in this sort of atomistic way, one development at a time. And so they're slow at doing it. Communities that have put together a community-wide plan and can make that plan public are essentially advertising to developers that this is what we think is important and if you choose to do development in the way we've laid out we've already done the thinking about it and you're not going to run into roadblocks mm -hmm. right you're not going to run into zoning problems you're not going to run into um, town approval <coughs> problems because the town's already thought it out and has a plan so just plug into our plan and you can do development there and so that development happens easier Mm -hmm. So that so having that sort of townwide plan for housing into the future, I think, is really important. Can I ask a follow-up question to that? Actually, of both of you, um, I hear what you're saying about having a local plan. Mm -hmm. However, um, as far as economic development and rural development goes in this state, we have something called Act Two Hundred and Fifty. I'm aware of it. Yeah, uh, which. Um, Many developers uh, and people who are coming from an entrepreneurial business development um, are critical of. Sure. Because of the multiple layers of bureaucracy and the, um, the permitting process is, is exhausting mm -hmm. for a lot of developers. Sure. I'm just wondering how each of you feel about that in terms of how we as a community can interact with our state regulators to try and smooth that process a bit. I'm happy to let one so I answer to you. That's a question. Yeah. And it's exactly 50. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just haven't, curious. Haven't yes. I think they've been talking about re redoing Act 250, haven't they, for <laughs> years now? Um, <laughs> I so I used to work in the agency of ag and ag development, and so um, one of my colleagues was one of the people that actually you know, reviewed some of the permits and did some of the mapping side of things. Um, my understanding of it is 
I think there's opportunities in the Randolph area because of um, because of the size of our community and the needs of our community versus uh, you know a larger scale need that um, that that there's a smaller way that we can deal with it that won't actually cause a lot of Act 250 issues. Um, I mean, those are. Act 250 really comes into play when you're really talking about building larger developments. And, um, you know, I think the accessory dwelling unit um, initiative that is happening now, I think is a great opportunity that um, that can play a good role. Um, and there's opportunities right now for that to be a little bit more affordable um, with state subsidies. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think the other thought I've always had about it is it seems like one of the biggest concerns of Act 250 is the additional cost of the permits. Um, if there is a disruption in you know, agricultural land. And um, I I feel like, I mean, even going back to what Matt was saying, you know, if, if Randolph has a good plan of like taking, figuring out where our assets are, where our opportunities are, um, there's a strategic way that we could look at where would be the most cost-effective way to make sure we could, um, add additional housing units at the lowest um at the lowest cost and if and even if we would have to tap into act 250 permitting um think about it as like a community effort you know i i think back to the whole <laughs> um effort that was made in between randolph and randolph center um to, to stop development, to keep the agricultural land. Um, you know, like, I think if we can get the community around like that whole idea of where the needs are and, and have them and have us all as a community realize like, okay, we're not doing it this way. We are thinking about it. We're not just doing it for this person or the small groups benefit. We're doing it, you know, as, as a whole thinking about what our, strategic goals are as a full community that um, we're actually pretty lucky um, to be where we are in the state. Um, but it all takes time. I mean, planning takes time, <laughs> let alone everything else. So, <laughs> so I'm, I'm not an expert on Act 250 or the, the Housing Board at all, but my understanding, a loose understanding of it is that when a community, if a community puts together a plan for housing, there are steps that the community can take relative to that plan that can make permitting around uh, Act 250 for projects that are in the plan easier for the developers to move through. Um, but I also think we have an opportunity here with the Opportunity Zone. Randolph sits in an economic opportunity zone uh, the large banks like Barclays, when the Opportunity Zone legislation passed at the federal level, told their large account, private account holders that uh, they, they had set up accounts for those large account holders to put capital gains and escrow them and wait for opportunities to invest. Um, does everyone understand what the Opportunity Zone is? Mm -hmm. So, so the banks still have those funds. There haven't been enough projects around the country for, for those investments to take place, largely because there haven't been, smaller communities haven't put together portfolio investments. It's all individual investments. And the banks don't want to invest in a million dollar project or even a $2 million project. They want to invest in a $15 million project. Well, how does a town like Randolph get to a $15 million project? Well, it's not one project. It's the hotel, and it's the smokestack property, and it's the five other empty properties around town that need to be redeveloped. And it's an addition on the hospital, and it's, you know, it's five 
things like that, and you roll that all together, and even though there are different owners of each project, they're rolled up into an Opportunity Zone fund. And now the bank is interested in investing in that fund, and that gets you access to low-cost capital, particularly in high-interest times like this, for all of those individual project holders to pursue their projects and get their projects done. So that's another way to think about how to attract the resources to do the housing development and other development. That needs to be done in town. And that financing side is more of a GMEDC role and a RACDC role. The town's not going to go out and take the lead on financing a project no, like that. Town... We may be able to help with zoning and we may be able to help with some type of plan for it or That's layout right. option. But right. we're not going to go chase. The revenue for somebody to do it. Or totally agree. Do totally the permitting agree. side of it. And it, where you get your savings on Act 250 is doing some level of pre permitting. And the yeah. town won't do that either. Right. GME, GME DC, GME will, DC sure. can do it. Sure. RACDC could do it. Somebody right. like that could right. do it. But you're, the way you're going to get your savings to a developer is for somebody else to do it. You're not going to get away with not doing it. No. Somebody's got to do it. Sure. Mm -hmm. It's who wants the headache. Sure. And the, the town has a role in, in the planning part, mm -hmm. in, in pulling together the different um, private owners and, and the town owns property too into a single plan. Um, that plan then can be taken by GMEDC or RACDC or someone else to that next level in the permitting or in the soliciting for funding. Do you have any more questions? No? Okay. <coughs> we will close the interviews. Thank, thank you both. Yeah, thank you, yeah, thank you for taking the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. We will move on to the manager's report. Just two quick check-ins that have come up. I was trying to count the weeks. We don't see again if we stay on our regular schedule for close to four weeks. One is we're still holding the 4th of July check. You want us to keep hanging on to that until we have a conversation? This is going to be... Let's do both. Send it and have a conversation? We can send it, and then what we're going to get back is the payment for the law enforcement services because the amounts are suspiciously similar. Um, so at a minimum, we end up back at zero, um, and then we can have the conversation. But, but we're, we're not supposed on to be it. paying from the law enforcement services. Yeah. So I gotta believe if we send it for the full amount, we're not gonna get a refund. No, they'll use it to pay. Did the bill. they give us anything that, uh, any level of detail of what we were paying, or just a pay this amount? Thank you for your continued support of the White River Valley Chamber of Commerce Town Appropriation Fourth of July One Unit at twenty five hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. I think they need to submit to us a little more detail of what we're paying for, yeah. especially given the amount of staff time and lining up our own volunteers that we had to do. And then the second one was, <coughs> is from Mark, and it's for RACDC. I think it was the hope was to include it in last week's conversation, but there was a lot going on that <laughs> night. So what there is, and I can pass it around before you do anything with it, it's just a letter, I mean, it's set up like a resolution, but it's essentially a letter of attestation. So meaning that we know that RACDC wants to, to pursue $25,000 in state funds through the Downtown Vibrancy Fund Program to complete some projects that fit within its overall downtown organization mission. No match, no admin, this isn't a pass-through, it's a straight grant for, for them or a straight payment to them. So there's nothing we have to do other than you as a legislative body has to say, yep, we understand that they're going for the money and we understand that if they get this money, it's not to supplant any local contributions to that. So we make about a $28,000 a year payment each year for downtown organization services and or. But it's an interesting thing. If it's for downtown organization services, we're okay. If it's for general support of the organization, and both arguments have been made, as I understand, recent years. But this is more of a 
perfunctory task that only requires signature if you're amenable to it and you pass it around before you sign it. It's pretty quick. But it doesn't require anything from us other than this task. Okay. That was all I had. I just have a quick follow-up question on the um, the animal case that we heard recently and we concluded that hearing. Has a, a formal letter gone out to Mr. Skrill or are we still? He and I spoke about the decision on Monday or Tuesday mm -hmm. and the formal letter has to follow within, we generally try to do them in about a week, week and a mm -hmm. half time frame. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's the one where we go through and we do the whole, here's the process. Here's what happened at the hearing. If you testified, here are the findings of the board. Here's the order. Mm -hmm. So that it has that. It looks a lot like a DRB decision in a lot of ways. There's a yeah, yeah. quasi judicial structure to it. Right. Okay. He is aware of what you ordered. So the only concern I have with that, that I called you on, was that Milo doesn't agree at all with what, what he told us that night. Mm -hmm. She claims that the um, the growth is not liquid. It's solid. She believes that the vet the vet told her um, he was 99% sure it's cancer. That the cancer is throughout the dog's body. And that it was they can't operate on it and he couldn't do anything more because he's not sure that there isn't an organ involved that's causing it to push out so Can, what I don't like is we made that decision based on his statements that were false can we reopen the hearing based on false testimony uh, allegedly yeah, false I, testimony I'd want to ask our legal advisors that one yeah I wouldn't think so as a matter of due process. However, given that there's a change in circumstance, maybe that does change something in the equation. Mm -hmm. but I, I don't know. That's not, that's not okay. 20 years. This has never gone away. The <laughs> dog's cancer is that and Another one. There you go. <laughs> right. We yeah. keep throwing them at you. Right. 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 I, I have not I just, right. I, just yeah. am, uh, I, I, I don't like the I don't like that he sat right here and lied to us. If that's the case, as I was trying to reach it, like somebody should interview the vet and get the facts right straight from him. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, There's only one reporter in the group. And one former <laughs> and animal, animal welfare. welfare. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> animal welfare organization <laughs> manager <laughs> too. So. <laughs> Who would that be? <laughs> Doctor. Doctor, how would you, what would your, <laughs> be your budget priorities for the coming year? Um, I, I, I just felt like... Let's have a conversation, Trina. I know you reached out to me. I yeah, can't find the email, fine. but let's have, I'm willing to speak with him and... Um, I think we got to first find out if it's even valid, mm -hmm. if we can. Yeah. I, but, uh, yeah. But given the fact that we acted on false information that was given to us, it, yeah. yeah. I don't know what you would what we would change. Like, I, I think our first priority still is to have him surrender the dog. Is that considered sworn testimony? I, you could. I mean, you're in a quasi-judicial proceeding, so right. it's as close as you get to it. Yeah. Um, and I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if there's a HIPAA for uh, um, no, veterinarians. <laughs> but, but um, you know, how much he may be willing to say. Um, to underscore what Milo has said, but well, maybe we I need mean, Milo to report back to us on what she's learned. Mm -hmm. I know yeah. she was on vacation the day that we had that hearing, so she wasn't able to participate. But I mean, it, 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 it's devolving once again into almost a more of an animal cruel, um, mm -hmm. a, a alleged animal cruelty. I don't want to choose my words. Um, but, but I think the state has said. It's not I pretty talk, much yeah, talk well, they're getting the again. care and that's kind of met our criteria but yeah, yeah but is, is the state is about? the state basing that on I don't know he said she said or is it you know I think she's got a relationship with the vet uh, yeah you know? that's how I'd understood it and and their pieces as long as there's some sort of either 
there's some sort of care management plan going forward, regardless of the condition the dog is in, that meets their criteria. So the dog that's released has to come with some sort of care management plan that then is assumed to be worked out. The state has a lot of work to do on its animal cruelty um, and animal welfare um, policies, let me tell you. Because <laughs> a lot of this stuff gets swept under the rug, and I, I'm tired of it personally. Mr. Legislator, <laughs> uh, and we have a lot of work to do um, at the state level on, on these issues because we're caught in a rock and hard place here. Um, and it's unfortunate, but it is what it is. So it would be nice to have tools even. We can recommend that somebody surrender the dog, strongly encourage it, say it over and over. We don't have that as a tool set, though, in our dog toolkit in statute by ordinance. So even I mean, even some of those smaller tools being enabled helps us maybe if, figure out more creative solutions. If, if indeed, the, you know, what's been alleged is true and the dog is riddled with cancer and organs might be operate, uh, you know, uh, compromised, then, then um, euthanasia is the most humane thing that can be done. Case closed. So. I'm, I hear what everybody's saying. I'm starting to wonder, though, given the limited tools that we have available, um, with, and given the fact that this dog is, is, seems rather unlikely to live really much longer or cause much of a threat to, to other folks, you know, I'm just wondering how much time we want to spend mm -hmm. you know, on, on this. this. This is really a good use of staff time, so, you know, board time, to be really spending more time on this. Yeah, yeah. I hear you. Well, I'm happy to reach out to the veterinary and see how much he may be willing to say, but I don't know how, I mean, our hands are kind of, it's kind of been proscribed by. I mean, deciding when to put down your dog is traditionally a pretty personal decision on the part absolutely. of the Absolutely, absolutely. Having been there and done that. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. So next up is uh, moving into executive session. This is a statutory one motion. The only you don't need the finding. It's outside of that list of six. So it's just the motion to enter. I would like to move that we go into executive executive session pursuant to one VSA three thirteen A three. Um, Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed. Motion carries.